There's a universe inside each of us. The Innerverse Podcast is your portal to that infinite realm of ideas. I'm Chance Garten, and I'll be your host as we serve up inspirational sound waves from the brightest minds with the highest vibes. And we keep searching for the empowering perspectives we need to create our greatest masterpiece of all, our lives. Welcome to the one within all back to Interverse. I hope you're keeping healthy and strong during this excellent apocalypse we're having. Best apocalypse ever. <laughs> and of course, by that, I don't mean the end of the world, but the original meaning of apocalypse, which is the lifting of the veil. This time around, we've got a double strength show thanks to today's guests who make up a true super duo in the fields of psychology and health. Topics which I always love to talk about. So please welcome this prodigious pair of badass body workers and sublime somatic strength builders to the podcast. Your awesome host, Stilia Nessus. Is that right? Yeah. Cool. And Sophie Fletcher. These are the two that we're going to be chatting with today about how to protect and promote our personal peace, presence, and power by investigating and integrating the most foundational ideas that we can put into practice to heal ourselves and maintain holistic wellness. Eurystemos is a transformational body worker and coach, and Sophie is a highly educated scholar in depth psychology and somatic studies. Somatic means body for anyone that's not aware of that jargon, but it's a really awesome word. Once you know it, some medical terms will make more sense to you. These two realms of psychology and body have long been kept socially distant from one another by mainstream medical academia, because at the end of the day, the goal of controllers is to sell you more pills. And the only thing being preserved by this madness is the prevalence of disease and a dependable dollar for the drug dealers. The truth is that to find healing and overcome trauma, we need to approach the physical, mental, and emotional bodies as the unified system that they are. And when we find our progress impeded while developing one aspect of our personal trinity, we can work with one other side or both other sides of ourselves to push through. We're going to be looking at this idea very closely in our talk with Eurasmos and Sophie. And in many ways, we're in a race against time to spread the truth about health to as many as can receive it because the state of Western society has never been sicker and is rapidly plummeting to the idiocracy level and lower. And I say that not out of a lack of compassion for people who are consumed by manipulative media and consuming chemical-laden concoctions, but out of a recognition that genius lives within all of us, spirit is always whole and intact, and it's simply a matter of dissolving the filters and constrictions in our form that prevent the emergence of our natural intelligence. We've all got amazing potential for intelligence. Just look at the word. The intellect principle plus the generative principle are what make up intelligence. And right there, you can see it's about balancing our two sides, right and left, masculine and feminine body and mind. But like I said, it's a pretty dire situation as we've lived to see the prophetic words of Aldous Huxley come true in our time when he said it back in the 50s or 60s that there will be in the next generation or so a pharmacological method of making people love their servitude and producing dictatorship without tears, so to speak, producing a kind of painless concentration camp for entire societies so that people will in fact have their liberties taken away from them, but will rather enjoy it because they will be distracted from any desire to rebel by propaganda or brainwashing or brainwashing enhanced by pharmacological methods. And this seems to be the final rev revolution. Well, Aldous got a lot right about that statement and not surprising since he was an insider to the master plan, but he was wrong about the last part because a revolution in consciousness is what's coming next. And it starts with us taking responsibility for our health in radical new ways. So make sure you go to healingwithyourestimos.com to uh, check out how you can contact this awesome pair for getting assistance by the their well educated and well well uh, traveled well practiced uh, high, highly awesome people definitely hope that you check the show notes for their links and also they're on Instagram all that will be there for you to easily click to and if you want the second hour of this conversation I'll remind you real quick you can sign up to interverse plus at patreon.com forward slash interverse so now let's get this awesome conversation going with the biodynamic duo who are redefining body positivity online and injecting truth inoculations into your mind. The excellent Eurasmos. Say they say your last name again, Stilionesis. sir. Stilionesis. Stilionesis. And Sophie Fletcher, the superb. Welcome to Interverse. Really excited to have you guys here. Yeah, Thank great you to so be much. on here. That was an awesome introduction, man. That was great. <laughs> I loved that. And that Aldous Huxley quote is, I feel like I've shared that on social media, like, dozens of times so it's a great quote 
Yeah, I admit, I admit that that's why I picked it up for writing this intro was looking at your Instagram. Both of you found lots of good quotes on there and yeah, we'll probably get to some of them. But, you know, a good one before we get into your background, or maybe this will be part of you guys giving a little bit of background on yourselves individually. But in your email signature, dude, you have the quote from Hero. Herophilus, is that how you say his last name? Herophilus, Herophilus, I'm not sure the exact name. Herophilus, they some all old, have like ancient Greek. Yeah, some old Greek duddy fuddy, buddy yeah. duddy. When health is absent, he says, wisdom cannot reveal itself, art cannot become manifest, strength cannot be exerted, wealth is useless, and reason is powerless. Awesome quote. How did you guys get there? <laughs> um, you know, I came across that quote probably maybe 15 years ago. I think it was on some pamphlet that I had, some health pamphlet. And uh, it just landed and it rang really true for me just in terms of like, what is the foundation? and What should we focus on? And, you know, if we aren't healthy, you know, what aren't we able to do? And, you know, my journey over the last, I would say, 15 years has really been to, to dive deep into these subjects and, and l- learn how can I be the healthiest I can be and how can I support other people to be healthy in that regard? And, you know, I, I kind of went through the ringer a little bit as a baby and as a child in the, in the, the Western allopathic system and dealt with some injuries. So I think maybe a seed was planted early on that, uh, that, that paradigm wasn't, uh, wasn't really inspiring health in me. And for whatever reason, my journey has taken me to where I am today. Uh, so that's, that's, in a nutshell, Sophie, I'm sure could add some things related to her. Um, in terms of the quote, I just think it's always that everything comes back to health in, in all the levels of our beings. I mean, without that, there's nothing else. What are you going to do? You can have all the money in the world. And if you're not healthy, if you're not vibrant, if you're not knowledgeable within yourself, there's nothing that you can do with that. There's nowhere you can go from there. Um, yeah, and that's how it, we enjoy life. Yeah, it's also like the one thing that I feel like is truly there's sustainability around it. When you have health, there's a sustainability that comes to you and your life and your relationships and your view of yourself and how you relate uh, to the world. Um, yeah, it's just something that's, I mean, I'm in love with it. I'm in love with health and the search for truth, the search for truth, the search for health and seeing beyond the veil too of what we're fed on a daily basis Uh, because if you look around and you observe what's going on there's not a lot of health that we're observing when we look around and so when you start with the observation then you go okay well why why is the health why why is there sickness everywhere why is there disease everywhere and then from there get to a place of you know i guess introspection investigation um And then we do the work we do because this is important to us. And there are foods out there that aren't being fed to the masses. And let, I mean, let's be real. When we're in elementary school, we're not taught about health. You know, when we're in junior high school and high school in our, in those state sponsored uh, education or prisons, let's be indoctrination, indoctrination, facilitation of facilities. You know, we're not really taught about the things that are going to help us thrive uh, as adults. Um, or even as like teenagers. So, you know, something that I speak about often and yeah, I'm just excited to be on the show with you and talk about whatever we're going to get into. I also totally. think it's the ultimate power to be healthy within yourself. I mean, physically, yes, we're, we're always talking about physically, but also mentally, also emotionally, also spiritually, all of the things. I mean, if you're really taking care of yourself on all of those levels, you're much more untouchable to others. Um, in terms of the indoctrination, in terms of other people's opinions, you can much more easily resonate with your own truth and then listen to everything else and know what what is the truth and what isn't out there. I mean, you can watch, you know, all of the symbolism and all of the the commercials and things like that are so you know, to brainwash you into certain belief systems. But if you're actually healthy and strong within yourself, that's not going to have the same impact. You're going to be more aware of it. You're going to be able to make choices much more easily for yourself. Um, And so I just think that sort of boils down to the ultimate power in your life of being more aware in all of those levels and the healthier you can be in all of those levels, the more 
everything else is going to wash off. That's brilliant. You really made a good point there that health and freedom are intricately linked. I mean, that's kind of being said in the quote down there because all of the things that uh, are not able to become manifest in that quote because of health problems are definitely freedom things. If you don't have strength, there's a bunch of limitations you now have. If you know, if you don't have the will or the desire to create art, all of a sudden you've cut off like an entire half of your being because we're not just consumers. We are creators. It's part of it's part of uh, our truest nature. And what I was thinking during both of you guys talking about this was how almost pretty much whatever conspiracy rabbit hole you might go down, it, once you become interested in finding out the truth about something, really finding out the truth about, about almost anything, inevitably it's going to lead to other things. And if you keep pursuing the path of truth from whatever starting point, eventually it's going to lead you to spirit and to health and how personal alchemy, if you will, requires actual uh, rebalancing of the, the chemicals of your own body. Like that's the real transmutation. That's the real great work of alchemy is the secret is all the other interpretations of it are just talking uh, metaphorically about this process of creating the most pure vessel we can for source energy to flow through. And what I think is awesome about that is kind of what you were saying too it, uh, your asmos was the how how I don't know. You, I think you're talking about this on enslaved. How you have so much more pleasure in the body when you're healthy, and how a lot of the society's problems and quirks, <laughs> mental health issues, all of that, it's like revolving around from this uh, extreme aversion to being in the, your own body, and how when you're unhealthy, how bad it feels to be in your body. I guess what I was thinking was anytime I've made a big healthy change in my life within a couple of weeks, sometimes within the day, like getting rid of a bad addiction or changing something in the diet that's really good or doing some kind of a cleanse or getting back into working out, you feel really, really, really good. And it's that's what I took it to mean when you said I'm in love with health. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that statement. And like, not to get, not that I get into the whole, law of attraction thing but just just in regards to like like how you're feeling about yourself and, and the frequency of your body and, and what you're vibrating out like you're more likely to to attract like things that meet that that match that you know if you're miserable and you hate life and you hate yourself like I doubt like your ideal partner is going to show up I doubt that your ideal job is going to show up and I don't just say that because I read some book like I've worked with clients who like have made the choice, have made a decision to overcome disempowering behaviors, to work on themselves, to walk through that door of transformation. And then like after working together a few times, they'll send me a text or a message. I'm like, oh my God, like I totally just met this amazing woman. Like, and like, because I, I want, I like, I really want to have a certain quality of human in my life. I need to work on myself. Like, because that person that I want isn't, that I ultimately want, isn't maybe going to want to be with me if I'm, like a slave to my addictions, et cetera, et cetera. So I just feel like it's this thing that when we work on ourselves, when we, when we learn to fall in love with ourselves and we actually, what I was also saying too, is that there's this aversion to not only just being in the body and pleasure, but just like a, afraid of feeling the pain of our existence, afraid of, of feeling the pain that's in our body because pain is such a great motivator to change. And if you're disconnected from the soma and you're not allowing yourself to feel that, and you're just like medicating yourself with pornography, with drugs, with, uh, you know, alcohol, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You can't be present to, to what's present. And so I think that's really important. And it's something that I talk about a lot with, the, with uh, the work I do with my coaching work. And obviously with even the body work, when we're engaging the body and we're wanting to go into the pain and breathe through the pain and get present to the pain, um, you know, most, uh, I would say most people don't want to do that. They don't want to, you know, go into the fire of their own existence and then come out, you know, as a new being, you know, there's a lot of fear there. Yeah. Wow, man. <laughs> Sophie, do you have anything to add to that? That's beautiful. I, I totally see what you're saying. I was I just thinking, I mean, Carl Jung talks about that a lot um, in his work. If he, he brings it up a lot of, that especially in the Western mind, the body has sort of been relegated to the shadows and it is pushed aside and it's, um, you know, denied. And 
I almost oh, said this things. quote that he's, yeah. uh, I must also have a dark side if I am to be whole. I put that off your Instagram, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I think it's that, that um, there's sort of this mentality uh, in the West of, of putting things into, into compartments and everything is sort of divided and, and made into these neat little boxes. And then you can kind of like push some of them aside and they can kind of like go into storage and never be um, looked at or talked about. But really what you're doing with that is you're just cutting yourself short. You're just not living your full life and living your full life can mean pain. I mean, it can be extremely uncomfortable and it can be really, um, you know, uncomfortable to be in the body and and of the body. And uh, as you said, I mean, both of us, we met training in a, in a very, very intense body work um, where you're actually being walked on by another person. And, you know, there were times when I was in those sessions and it was like excruciating because you're going into tissue, you're going into um, all of the denseness of the body and it's being broken up and it's painful, but it's, then you have access to it. And then you have all this new energy, all this new life force that can flow through you in places that were stagnant before. And these boxes that had been put away into sort of no man's land as you pull them out. Yeah, it might be like dusty and, and you know, mildewy to like open it. But like once you do, it's like you have so much more free space. You have more um, just openness within your being. And, you know, I love that you brought in the creativity piece because. I think a lot of people don't really associate like body work and creativity as being really interlinked. I mean, if you're stagnant in your body, if you have all of, um, you know, these blocked areas within you, that's way less um, energy that can flow through you. You have less chi, you have less of this, this, you uh, know, that, um, that quote you always talk about of the pond and the stagnant pond is the one where, Oh, it's uh, this idea that if you think about, again, the body is having these like rivers of energy, of blood, of lymph, that, you know, pain is this, in, in Chinese medicine, they have a simple saying that you know, where there's pain, there's no flow. So again, look at the body and like seeing where there's pain, there's, there's this idea that there's no flow happening. And so, you know, I, when I was younger, I've gone hiking and camping and people used to say, don't uh, drink water from a stagnant pond because there's more likelihood of bacteria, viruses, et cetera, to manifest, you know? Um, but if the water's flowing, then, you know, you're more, it's better to kind of filter your water through there. I mean, I might be butchering a little bit, but I'm just simplifying this idea that movement is life. Stagnation is death. And so when you can actually create more movement and flow in your body, that's going to support creativity and, uh, you know, actually the a quote that we had in our healing room, um, and we're moving to a new place, but the quote that we did have was, uh, the most creative act you will ever undertake is the act of creating yourself. And so I think a lot of people think of themselves not being creative, but every day is a create, creation. Every choice you make is a, is a potential creation. And so I think when you look at, at that, especially in terms of expanding your consciousness, there's so much that can come from that. And it's really powerful to understand that you have personal responsibility to, to, uh, yeah, to cultivate that within yourself and to be more creative. So. But I, I, the emphasis for me is always on like a lot of, I feel like, um, a lot of more of like the spiritual communities or mindset is sort of like transcending the body and like releasing the body and being, you know, not in the body, not of the body kind of thing. And, and I really like to sort of push the opposite that it's actually through the body that we get to experience all of this. And the more that we open up our bodies, the more that we're actually grounded in our bodies, the more that we're actually in tune with our bodies, we actually are more creative. We're more energetically sensitive. We're more, um, you know, aware of everything because it's how we take in all information is through our body. So if our body is healthy and and energy is moving through it there's we have so much more access to variation in ourselves and super important what you're talking about because like for my history my personal experience whenever i first got into 
thinking outside the box and trying to figure out myself spiritually just from that angle. I was healthier at that time than at previous times in my life. So there's a connection there, but I had that idea still infecting me of like, the, this body isn't me or whatever. And I was so ungrounded. Friends of mine, if any are listening to this, remember me from five or six years ago. I was pretty head in the clouds and like kind of a little on the ridiculous side of what you might call a new age guy stereotype. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I, I don't judge myself for being in that place. It was, I, I was all good intentions and great times, but not grounded, not realistic, not manifesting anything in my life that was like anchored in permanently that would begin to grow and become something significant like the show, for example. Anyway, I met my partner uh, uh, like a year before I started this show and I was very open to it, but she assisted me getting a healthier diet going. Primarily, that was like the main thing that changed in that relationship once it began. And I got super grounded just in just from that, just from getting on that process of... At that point, after the changing of the diet, I got into like doing some detox and cleanse stuff. Nothing too major, but just a, a few regimens like that. Just clean out the colon a couple of times and also made a huge difference in my level of groundedness. And it's like, now I have access to that head in the clouds, super spiritual heady guy, but I, <laughs> I can function in the world. I can like, I can work on something. I can access both sides of the brain, so to speak. And anyway, I think that's super important. Also, I've tried to talk on the show about character armoring and how that relates to physical mm-hmm. armoring. And you're kind of talking about that a little bit there. And I mean, you may have other responses first and that's totally uh, good, but I want to work our way towards talking about this armoring concept because I'm sure you guys will be able to explain it in a really good way. Uh, Yeah. Well, even just in response to what you said, it's, I feel like that's the first step for a lot of people as they start looking at food as medicine. It's like, I think it was Hippocrates, Hippocrates. Can't pronounce these uh, ancient Greeks too well. I should since it's my lineage. But uh, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And so it's kind of the first step for, I think, for a lot of people that I, I know in, 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 these, in this movement or the people that want to seek health. Um, you know, they just start by changing how they eat. And it kind of was big for me, too, because I, I started eating healthier and I started noticing that my, my psychology and my thoughts and my emotions shifted. And that really kind of planted a really big seed in me, you know, and then everything. The emotions of, actually uh, get deeper. Yeah. Interestingly. Yeah. I, 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 you know, it's actually funny that, not funny, but I love that you say that. It's like, I think people think that like once they go on this like path of awakening or, or healing that like, I'm, I'm going to feel good all the time and I'm not going to have emotions. And I just don't agree with that. I actually feel like I feel more human and I'm more like, there's more juice in my life that I get to navigate the more I've done my work. Because I've also like, you talk about interverse, like, you, you become more open to the, the universe, to, to the universe that is within you and like the, the opposites that live within you. And there's this like this embracing of both, you know, it's like you said, Oh, I was on the head in the clouds, but it wasn't so grounded. So it's not this either or way of this, of looking at things, but like a both and where you can have your arms around opposing contradictory elements of you. And that's pretty much the nature of the human psyche is this concept it's compensatory. So the more we identify with one way of being and hold on to it as it's like our own, our inner truth, there's opposite energy that gets pushed into the unconscious, which again, Mm -hmm. we like to say gets pushed into the forms uh, to segue in like forms armoring. So the more repression a person has, there's going to be more armoring. And when you, the body is armored, you know, that impacts your character and within character is how you move. It's how you emote is how you think. And that armoring kind of acts literally as a wall between the external world, but also with the, the depths of who you are. And so the more we can break down that armoring through body work, through the tissue work, through some other work we do, I think it really helps people relate to the external world in a much more intimate, connected way. And also, also uh, connect to their inner world, uh, their inner truth, and to really look deep down inside, like what's going on? Where's my wounding coming from? Trauma's coming up to the surface, et cetera, et cetera. Now, this is a really a good question for Sophie, but when it comes to this connection between the physical armoring, the stuck energy in your field and those psychological 
parallels of, you know, trauma at different times in your life, potentially young childhood stuff that you might not even fully remember is I, I won't say that I am asking if it's either or I, I'm sure that it's some kind of combination of both, but how is it always completely, <clears throat> completely necessary to have like recall of certain traumatic events in order to heal from them? Or are there some instances where the body route is going to be all you really need to do? I, I guess is my question. Yeah, it's a really good question. It's a question I feel like um, comes up a lot. Um, I, I think different schools have different thoughts on this. Um, from my perspective, I would say that you really don't have to have exact recall at all. Um, you know, somatic experiencing, Peter Levine talks about that a lot, that you really don't have to have recall. It's really the body remembering what it remembers and moving through it somatically. Um, and so the body really can take over and the mind can kind of just observe. And, um, I also remember one of my teachers once saying, he was like, you know, um, there was a sharing happening in a course that I was in and it was about, you know, I, I understand. I just, I was making this intention to understand this issue that I have. And he was like, you can understand it from every single direction and every single way. And it's still going to be there. So do you want to just understand it or do you want to shift it? And she was like, oh, well, I want to shift it. And she was like, well, then you don't have to understand it. Like understanding it doesn't necessarily shift it. It can help at certain times. And I think there, there's a natural inclination to want to know and want to understand and want to have, you know, this full story within yourself. Um, but it's not necessary. And I think a lot of the times what I've found is when I get really attached to the story, it's much harder for me to let go of it. It's much harder for me to shift whatever has come from that within myself, because now I'm stuck in this story. Now I have this whole picture. Now I have this whole narrative running within me. And that can kind of like, it can get a little more sticky for me to shift it. Um, and so That's I, actually, you said that. I was just thinking it's yeah. like a B it's like BS. It's a big sticky belief system. Exactly. <laughs> totally. I love that. Um, yeah, because I think our minds are so powerful. And so when you give it this story, when you give it something like a narrative, it becomes more of an identity versus just like something that your body is working out. And, and there's also, you know, um, there's a lot of thought around whatever happened, whether it's true or not, it's true to you. So whether or not you're, you know, the story of like your parent went to the grocery store for an hour, but for you as a tiny child, that interpretation was like your, your parent left you for months. Like, okay, so the truth of the story is that your parent went away for an hour, but for you internally, something happened, something shifted that felt like you were abandoned for a massive amount of time. So even though that's not the truth, that's how it's landed within yourself. That's how it's being interpreted through your being at that time. So the narrative doesn't always necessarily fit the experience. So go with the experience. Like go with what, what the internalization of whatever happened was for you and work through it somatically. Um, you know, there's the, there's the whole debate of top down versus bottom up. Um, I think both are incredibly important. I do not knock therapy at all. I think it's, I think it's incredibly important. Um, and I personally think that bottom up is just as important. And I think that, um, you know, a lot of emphasis has been on the top down of psychology for many, 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 many years. Even that um, conception's tricky, higher and lower, right? Because in a way it's like core and surface and that yeah. makes it a lot more one thing when you yeah. look at it that way. Absolutely. Um, so I, yeah, just, I guess the, the short answer to your question is no, I do not think that you need to know the story. I don't think you need to know the narrative. I don't think you need to know the exact facts. Um, I think you need to go with what the experience was for you and how that got held within your consciousness. Um, so it's like how it feels basically is what you mean. Exactly. And how your body, I mean, how, how it came when you're talking about armoring in terms of 
how your body posture has been shifted by certain things, um, things like that. It's like working with that first and foremost, because that's more of the, the inner workings of your being rather than this conceptual, how it should be or shouldn't be or whatever. It's going more to the truth of the matter. Very cool. I wish they'd teach you this stuff in health class in high school. My health <laughs> teacher just told stories about how awesome he was in high school. That was the whole <laughs> class. He didn't actually teach us anything about health. And it was like widely known that that's what this, how this guy taught health class. It was like, whenever you were finally, whatever year in high school you were supposed to be to take that class with them, everyone was excited about it. Like, did you hear you just hang out and don't do anything? And he just tells jokes and stories. I'm, not, I'm serious. And like, that's how it was. It's that that's how little the importance was in the town where I went to school. And it wasn't even like a low, a low fire, a lowly, let's see, low budget school district. That's the word I'm looking for. It wasn't, it was like a pretty good school district and that's just what it was. So I find that really amazing. <laughs> you know, listen, on, on the most basic level, and we could all probably understand that if, if we have a population that's healthy, a lot of people aren't making money. You just nailed it. That's kind of where I was going next. <laughs> like on January 1st, man, you put this amazingly prophetic quote on your Instagram where you said, I know I'm quoting your Instagrams a lot, but there was good stuff there. Uh, May the year 2020 and this new decade bring us all more clarity of vision to see how our social engineers conspire to keep health, humanity diseased, distracted, disempowered, and dysfunctional. Together we rise. Knowledge is power. Health is wealth. So it looks like you got your prediction right. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's, it's such a trip because I think it was like a month and a half ago, I just happened to go through my, my and I don't post too much on my uh, feed. I, I tend to post a little bit more on my stories. And I saw that and I went, oh shit. Like I totally forgot that I had posted it and then I shared it to my story, but it's so true. I mean, we're just getting like an upfront look on, on all of it. You know, of course, I would say that most of the people probably listening to your show have a certain mindset, you know, but still a lot of the people, the majority you would think, that idea is crazy, yeah. but it's true. Uh, I like to say, I like the idea that the world's not getting darker, but people's veils separating them from reality are going away. Like, that's why I say true. best apocalypse ever. <laughs> true. No, it's true. I think so. Listen, people are, people are getting more woke, you know, they're, 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 they are seeing behind the veil more. They're starting to realize like, yo, the mainstream media, like this shit is crazy. Like what is going on? I was at so, the gym today and I saw like, I can't not see the TVs that play CNN and Fox news in the gym. I try to avoid them. I listen to something else, but I just glanced at it at one point in, in the subtitles because they make sure and turn those on. So you can at least get the yeah. indoctrination. If you glance over there, these two women were talking on CNN about how the number of confirmed cases right now in the United States was so high, but then, and I quote, we know from our conversation with the director of the CDC a few days ago that these confirmed cases numbers are actually not correct and that for every infected person that we test in the United States, there are 10 infected people who we don't test. And I'm just like, how in the hell do you know that? How could you possibly know that? <laughs> that does, that's literally just the craziest thing I've ever seen. And that was from watching it for one minute. So, uh, but people do take that as gospel. I mean, uh, we could, that could easily be a good part of the conversation here because it, it, we could talk about the touch factor, which I think is super important. I've heard you guys speak on before and social distancing when it comes to the human biofield. If you guys are like, that's one thing I'm really getting into right now is the human biofield and I uh, picked up some cool tuning forks that I'm going to be experimenting with cool. as well. But you know, at the end of this little tirade, the pharmaceutical industry creates Claims to create cures, but really it's just customers. But even the word cure is weird because compared to the word healing, which means to like fix and repair and restore something, cure primarily means to preserve something and keep it how it is. I mean, that tells you everything you need to know. That wasn't a, a word used for mm. by healers in the, in the past. They didn't say they're going to cure you. That came about with these, uh, like a hundred years ago with these in institutions we currently have. Yeah, I like that distinction a lot. Yeah, well, yeah, I, man. yeah. I don't know if you want, what you want to, what you want me to comment, con, want us to I comment. I kind of threw a lot at you guys there, didn't I? Let's talk a little bit about the the touch factor because I've talked about the mask thing uh, on a previous episode and why 
like some of the symbolism behind that. And that was really interesting, but we didn't talk about the human touch factor. And uh, we're, we're looking at one of the most important aspects of human development and just human sanity here, if I'm not mistaken. No, no, I'm sure Sophie, Sophie's doing her dissertation on this topic so she can take this one away. Yeah, it's perfectly timed, unfortunately. Um, I mean, obviously I picked my dissertation topic years ago, so I didn't know. Um, but yeah, I mean, my, I'm, I'm studying the interrelational dynamics of physical contact between people um, for my dissertation, really looking at what happens when there's physical contact between people, um, specifically in terms of this idea of the parapersonal space um, that neuroscience has started commenting on and, and parapersonal space is this um, sort of like area, like a few inches around your body, um, kind of this amoeba. And when you move, it moves with you. And um, it's when you touch something, this parapersonal space actually engulfs what it is that you touch. And your brain and the somatosensory cortex actually maps whatever you're touching, whatever is engulfed by this parapersonal space as part of yourself. So it's no longer I stop where my skin stops now. I mean, I'm sitting on a chair. So right now my brain is sort of mapping this chair as part of me so that if something happens with the chair, I can sort of react more um, quickly. And my, my favorite um, sort of uh, uh, picture depiction of this is if you're ever driving and you go over something low hanging and you duck and like mentally, like intellectually, I understand that me moving my head is not going to change whatever happens to the roof of the car. But this your parapersonal space has actually engulfed the car at this point. And so your brain is mapping the outside of the car as the outside of your body. Um, and so this has been studied um, quite a bit with um, with inanimate objects. So like artificial limbs, tools, um, things like that, but it hasn't really been studied interpersonally yet. And so that's really what I wanted to, to look at was what happens, you know, when we're, when we touch another person, there's so much science that actually backs this up, but it just hasn't been studied specifically um, in certain ways. But when you touch another person, there's, there's links that happen. I mean, there's, there's major electrical channels that get linked up um, your brain actually starts mapping the other person's nervous system, all of that. And your skin is actually the external part of your nervous system. So the the same cell that develops your nervous system also develops the skin in the first sense that is developed within the embryo or the yeah, embryo, the, mm-hmm. the, the <laughs> baby. Um, yeah. And so a lot of people call it the mother of the senses because all other senses actually develop after um, and from the skin. So it's a huge, 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 huge piece of your development. It's how you develop your own sense of self is how you, you know, brush up against the world. Um, You know, as a, as a baby in the amniotic fluid, you're pushing up against the walls um, of the uterus and all of that. So it's like, you're learning your boundaries. You're learning where you start, where you end. And it's a huge feed for the baby um, and all of that sensory experience. And then there's extensive, extensive study on the fact that babies, if they are, you know, fed and warm and in a sterile environment and all of that, um, if they are not touched, if they are not coddled, cuddled, um, they will die. It's as simple as you can have all of the other necessary ingredients for a baby and they will die if they are not actually physically touched as well. Whereas you can put a baby in less than ideal environment, give them physical touch and they will thrive much more than a baby who doesn't. So, you know, it's sort of this flippant thing um, that people talk about with touch, but it's not. It is extremely vital Um, Tiffany Field and um, Ashley Montague talk about it. Ashley Montague has passed away, but talked about it a lot of that we are in a touch hungry and touch starved um, culture. And it's really, it puts us out of touch with everything. And so even, um, you know, when we're talking about, I think it was, it was prior in our, in our initial 
um, talking when we got on, but you said like, go outside and put your feet on the ground. I mean, it's that simple of like grounding when you're physically in touch with another thing, you are more likely to care about it. You're more likely to be in compassion and empathy in, um, in relationship with this other thing. If you're completely disconnected from them physically, you're completely disconnected. I mean, it's just, you're not going to have care for the earth. You're not going to have care for the people around you. Um, and so, and you're going to be isolated. You're, it, it heightens depression. Um, it heightens aggression. It heightens, um, um, why am I, I'm blanky, but basically weakens, all the bad It weakens things. your immune system. <laughs> Thank you. It weakens the immune system. Like it's all of these things where it's like this perfect concoction where, you know, suicide rates are, are skyrocketing. Um, child abuse is skyrocketing. Spousal abuse is skyrocketing. When you're out of touch, when you're isolated, when you're, you know, all of these things. Even that That's phrase, like out of caution. touch, like she's so out of touch, I mean, meaning like she's unrealistic or ungrounded or, you know, man, there's a lot. I didn't mean to cut in there. Sorry, but. No, thank you. I was, on, I was on our rant. Um, no, it's good. It's a good rant. Really needed. We need to, to hear this and we need to think about this. Yeah. Uh, touch is so, it's so important. You know, I don't know if people have taken the love language quizzes and that whole thing. Like I know for me and my wife, it's important, but everything she just said like it's necessary. It's necessary for regulating your nervous system. In my opinion, I mean, you can touch, obviously you can like touch yourself and, and have an impact, but just giving someone a hug, you know, I had a, a, a friend of mine who I, who I've worked with, he, he was kind of isolating for, for a bit, you know, and, um, and then we connected and like, we gave each other this hug and he was just like, you can tell he was starving for it, starving for that connection, like feeling like, that was life force right there, just connecting with another person. Um, yeah. Have you guys ever had the experience when, I mean, it sounds like you did right there, but you ever noticed someone just literally getting grounded from hugging you? Because oh, yeah. Being a person that is grounded, like there's a real electrical thing that happens. I've, I have witnessed it really to a dramatic degree. Um, what'll happen is I'll give someone a really gentle hug and I'm not squeezing in any capacity and we're still and just in this embrace. And I feel parts of their body like popping and cracking. And it sounds like muscles or um, bones cracking or something. But it's really what I've come to think it is, is more of an electrical thing that I'm noticing. It's like popping <laughs> the way like a, like batteries, man. It's really interesting. And a lot yeah. of our friends and family are going without ever touching the earth. They're in indoors. They are you know, rubber soled shoes, they're mm -hmm. surrounded by electronics with dirty electricity that they can't even see how that's influencing their biofield. It's a real, it's a real big deal. <laughs> yeah, it's huge, man. It's huge. And like, even just to bring up, I know we've talked to this on this topic before, but just the idea, even with men, you know, like in our culture, it's just like, like, like healthy platonic touch is like, you know, oh, if you hug another man, like, what does that say about you? You know, and like in other cultures, like you see, like, uh, heterosexual men just holding hands and embracing. And I just feel like in our culture, it's like men, in order to get touch, it has to, ha it usually happens through violence or through sex because it's like, we're, cause we're craving it. We, we need that touch. You know, women tend to get it more because they're a little bit more of, as again, this is a general rule. I'm not stating it for every male and every female, but as a general rule, women are much more comfortable and they're engaging and they're hugging each other. They're having sleepovers and that kind of thing. Whereas for men, like we don't, we don't do that growing. We're, we're taught not to do that. Like, oh, you're, you're weak if you hug someone or you're, you know, you're a pussy or whatever the case might may be. No, that's super real. Luckily, uh, uh, my dude friends are all pretty hug friendly. None of us are holding hands, but I guess it wouldn't bother me if I did. I wouldn't feel like I was somehow threatened by that. And anyway, that's a, yeah, that's a really I'm not saying that point. we have to go around holding hands. I'm just using this no. example that even just like walking down, like, arm over shoulder, like shooting the shit and having fun. You know what I mean? One of my nicest friends who's a guy will just go around the circle. If we're like around the campfire and just give people five minute shoulder rubs, yeah. regardless of who they are to him or their gender, or if he just met them or what. And he's one of the best people I know. <laughs> and he's always making people happy with that. And it, I've noticed myself if like my partner's out of town for a week or something, I get touch starved just by going to, my job and coming home and not really being around people that I'm close with when there's no, 
there's no outlet for it. I mean, to make another electrical pun, it's, uh, mm-hmm. it, I think that's interesting too, when you relate it to massage, cause I know that you're into body work. Think about how sometimes people don't have any tolerance for like pressure with a massage yet with the most gentle type of barely even doing any kind of kneading to the, to the skin, they're getting relaxed. Their muscles are letting go. Like it's, it's so miraculous. I mean, we can't overstate that, I think. Yeah, I mean, we're social beings. Our brains are wired to be social and to be in contact with others. Um, and so when we're not, we're going against our nature. We are, we're literally like starving ourselves of something that is so incredibly vital for our being. And our architects of control, they know this. And so this is very uh, interesting. That's all I've got to say on that. And a lot of this touch thing works on the human biofield, which is this electro- electric field around our bodies generated by our bodies. And the level of our health dictates how weak or strong that field might be. But it generally is like six feet. And here we are with being told to stay six feet away from each other. That's not an accident, man. They, there is a desire to make people feel disconnected from each other, scared of each other. Uh, it's a, a bit of a repeat from a past topic to get into masks, but that also has a lot of on a psychological side connotations. I'm sure Sophie, you've given that some thought how like you're basically a bandit. If you wear a mask, it's only modern day that some superheroes wore masks. There was never really a positive reason to go out in public with a mask in Western culture, mm-hmm. maybe in other tri- tribes, that's not the case, but, um, well, even with the mask, not to, not to, no, oh, yeah, go. Go ahead. It's it's further disconnection in yeah. terms of you now can't see somebody's face. You now can't read if they're smiling, if they're frowning. You can't, you know, use their facial expressions because so, 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 so much communication is not through the vocal. And the childhood um, development honestly. side of that. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I just keep thinking about the children who are being brought, you know, at critical developmental stages right now and and seeing everybody with masks or even having to wear a mask themselves. And it really, it hinders the development of empathy for others. I mean, there's, there's extensive study on that in terms of like video games and stuff like that. If you're not interacting with other humans, um, there's just developmental aspects that don't get to come online and putting a mask over somebody's face is a huge hindrance to that. I mean, not being able to read somebody's body language of their face is just huge in terms of how you're going to feel around them. Yeah. I think hopefully it's obvious enough to people. If you hadn't thought about it this way, it should send you on a different direction. of thought about the whole subject and you'll probably come to a lot of realizations that we would bring up if we kept on the subject. But while we're in the first hour, I think it'd be cool if we could give listeners some homework that would be like akin to uh, something that they could do for themselves that would be easy, that might um, on the body side, help, help this balancing thing. You know, like what are, what are some things that are in your personal toolkits for your own selves staying balanced on the, on the daily? I I think, um, well, there's breathing practices, but even just self massage work, like using different tools to get into your tissues, whether it's like a hard medicine ball or a lacrosse ball or a PVC pipe, or just kind of like laying your, the dense muscle groups on these tools and letting gravity do its job, not rolling back and forth. Like, you know, you see people with the foam roller, like, but just finding these, these dense bits and just letting your weight, like put the pressure on and breathing into it and getting present to the, whatever sensation and pain you're feeling. I think can release a lot of stress. It can help. It can help with how you move. It can it can release pain from the body, uh, from your joints, and so that's just. I just think like not everyone needs to go and spend a hundred dollars, eighty dollars, one hundred, whatever, to go see a massage therapist, which is nice. Obviously, have the other physical touch there, but there's things you can do on your own. You know, you can roll out. You can pretty much roll out. Not roll out. You can you know release with different tools, all different tissues on your body. And that alone can like make you feel more grounded, more embodied, more connected to your breath, more connected to yourself, um, and release anxiety, release the stress from the system. So that's a simple, simple thing to do. Just release myofascial release work. 
And you can start with like just a tennis ball, um, you know, financially and things like that. It's, it's pretty easy and pretty cheap to, to get, you know, a, a thing of three tennis balls or a, a small thing of like PVC, PVC pipe or something like that. You don't have to get fancy with all these different um, tools and things like that, but you can, you can really do it cheaply where you just have something and it's just something that gets you more in touch with your body. If you're going to lie on it or put a piece of your body on it and feel whatever sensation, I mean, there's, if there's stagnation and things like that, there's going to be some pain, but if you can stay with that, if you can breathe with that, if you can feel into that, that's huge in terms of getting more in, in touch with your own being and your own process. Um, and then especially since I'm the touch person, I would also say like self-massage of your own hands, you know, like put your hand on your body. And I'm not saying that in like a sexual way. I'm just saying like, really like, like squeeze your own shoulder, squeeze your own hand, um, hold your own hand. There are times, you know, where it's like, I'll fall asleep and I'll like literally like grasp my hands together just as like, you know, you can be there with yourself, especially in this time of isolation of how do you how do you maintain contact with yourself? And that's also a huge thing about boundaries and borders of yourself. Like, how do you maintain like, okay, this is me. Like, this is who I am. That's who the other person is. And just noticing that difference um, between yourself and another. And uh, yeah, you know, so I kind of really want to show like at least one of the, the exercises that we teach people, the sure. Meridian exercises. Go for it. Yeah, I'm sure they appreciate it. Right, right, right now? I don't know. I was kind of thinking a large intestine would be like the easiest to show. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we'll have a video version of this out there. So people that are just on the audio can easily flip over yeah, to there, the YouTube there, yeah, video. Yeah, there's, there's different exercises that we, that we learned that correlate with the different uh, Chinese meridians. The work we do is rooted in traditional Chinese meridian theory and different muscles and fascia correlate with the energy channels. So when Like Qigong? Um, yeah, well, I wouldn't say the exercises are like Qigong unless Sophie, you, I mean, I'm, I'm, I've heard of Qigong and I've done some exercises, but these are more resistance exercises where you're, you're okay. beating your own resistance to open up the tissue, to get the blood and lymph and energy to flow. So it's like kind of stretching the body, but without overstretching the body, which, which is what you get with, I think a lot of different practices, they kind of overstretch the body. So it's strengthening and stretching the body and opening up the different channels of energy. Um, so they work on the different meridians and also within the body, the different meridians correlate with different psycho emotional traits. So if there's blockages in the energy channel, you're more likely to operate from a disempowering place. If it, there, if there's flow, you're more likely to embody the, the empowering traits. So that's where like, again, there's, there's a psychological correlations within these different, uh, meridians in the body as well. Yeah, so, I think that's so true. I mean, it, it relates to different flavors of emotion, different parts of the body. There's like a whole anatom anatomical map you can derive from this. But yeah, Sophie, if you wanted to show us something, I'm definitely up for it. <laughs> well, I was, you'd ask us, do you want to walk them through the large intestine? Well, there's, diff there's different, yeah, there's different ways of doing it. So, I mean, I must, I'm, I'm not, let's see if we can do it here. I must, I'm be sitting down. Normally I'd be standing up. So okay. like there's like eagle arms in that people do in traditional yoga, but a lot of people can't get into it. So I'm going to do a, a modified version. I'll of show that. that. Okay, like you can show that. And so the large intestine channel runs up and runs right through the back. So you're kind of working on the kind of the I would say the rear part of the shoulder to open up this channel. And so he's doing it with the with the eagle arm version, but you can just do it to a place where let's say you're standing up, you have a 90 degree angle. You know, your fist is pointing to the sky. It's right in front of you. You take your other hand and then you pull your elbow across the body to start here. Okay. So you create a connection. You want 90 degrees, 90 degrees are parallel to the floor. Now you create an isometric contraction. So your elbow's pushing out while your hand's pushing in just to get that initial contraction. And then you would take a deep inhale. And then as you exhale, you would beat your own force. So I'm resisting with my hand and pushing out like this for three seconds. Okay, holding here, keep the tension on throughout the whole series, take a deep inhale in, as you exhale, resist with your elbow as you beat your own force with your hand for six, five, four, three, two, one, you pull it across your body, and then you would do that, three out, and then six, so the whole point is like using resistance as a metaphor, 
that you're beating your own resistance and you're helping to open up these energy channels without overstretching the body, getting blood, getting lymph to flow, building strength, building true flexibility. Did that make sense? Yeah. And like I have done a good amount of Qigong in my time and I know sort of what it feels like to be activating one of those meridian channels. And I could feel the channel that you were describing whenever oh, I cool. did, did that exact thing. So, so that's just a simple one. There's, there's a whole bunch to do. I've got to do a session with you guys and learn some tricks. Oh man, dude, fly out to, fly out to Cali, dude. We'd love oh, to yeah, have that, you. <laughs> <laughs> I might want one sooner than I can pull off a flight to Cali, but yeah, that'll, that'll happen eventually. Right. I mean, someday I'm going to be traveling more. Yeah, we'll get it. We'll, or we'll just get on a Zoom chat and I'll show you do some a stuff. Zoom session. I, I'm well, excited I about that. I love those stealth exercises too, because it's really, I think it's such a, it's an awesome way of getting people really involved in their own healing, their own, like, oh, I can actually work on my own body. I don't, you know, it's sort of like, um, we can give sort of like exercises to do in between sessions and things like that. You can do a whole routine of these 12 exercises that work on 12 different meridians every single day for yourself. and keep your body flowing so and the it's, key is to more keep, empowerment yeah and the key is to stay contracted and keep resistance because that's also going to help prevent injury uh, injury gotcha. and overstretching yeah yeah i think i've run into overstretching a bunch of times in my life <laughs> i mean a lot of times when i'm stretching it's not that different than what they told me to do in pe class totally which and maybe not the best learning place but um amazing amazing i kind of lost what I was going to say there, but let's uh, give you guys a good couple of minutes to let people know how to find you all and the free crowd can hit you up cool. whenever they need to do some work with you. Yeah. Talk um, about a bit what you do with people because there's more than just the body work actually. You can give them a little overview. For sure. I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, best way to contact me is at my email address, healingwithyourosimos at gmail.com. I have a website. But it's really basic, healingwitherosmos.com. I'm in the process of reimagining it with all of my different offerings. So email is the best way. Um, but yeah, my focus is uh, the transformational body work I do. Um, I'm also a freedom from self-sabotage coach, self, like getting really into the reasons why people self-sabotage on an internal and external level. And then there's an esoteric system that both of us are trained in called human design that I'm really uh, into. And so I, I give human design readings as well. But uh, yeah, but bodywork sessions, uh, usually 90 minutes. Um, there's Zoom, Zoom consultations as well. And, and uh, I'm doing uh, my, I have a full day. I don't know if you have any listeners that are in Southern California, but I have my full day men's event that I do. It's an entire day, eight hours of somatic, deep somatic practices. That's kind of my contribution to men's work, but it's more somatic men's work. And my next one is uh, Sunday, July 19th. And then uh, Saturday, July 25th, I team up with a friend of mine who's a, a mindset coach and also uh, created his own unique work called Flow Masters, which is a, a way of supporting people to uh, authentically express themselves. Uh, we teamed up and we created this online experience called Somatic Flow Masters, and we've done it twice already. We started during the lockdown, and uh, our next one is Saturday, uh, July 25th. It's about three and a half hours long. It's another opportunity for men to come together to connect, to be real, to do some deep work. Uh, we do a bunch of, we do four of these exercises that one of them, ones that Sophie, well, the one that I showed you, that's one of them. Anyways. So, uh, yeah, just hit me up. Sophie. (laughs) Um, well at the moment I'm still sort of like, uh, pretty much just focused on my getting my dissertation completed so I can, uh, complete the PhD track that I've been on for a little while. Um, but I will be, bringing in more of the one-on-one um, bodywork sessions. I'm trained in um, Chinat Song, which is internal belly organ massage, um, Jin Chun Jutsu, which is more of like an energetic um, hand-holding situation for the meridians, um, the, the same bodywork that Yerasimos does, which is more of the, the walking on people, the exercises, um, trained in different breathwork modalities, um, we're also both in the in the process. We're both in the intermediate level of somatic experiencing. Peter Levine's work. I'm uh, about to do our uh, another training of that next week. Um, that can be done over Zoom and internet and all the fun things. Um, so yeah, 
Awesome. Give them your Instagrams too, because I know that they can at least follow you there. And also after this, I'll give you guys links to the Interverse Discord and I'll let you know when the show comes out. And if you want to, you can be available for, for a chat for the, the day or two after the show comes out at, in case anybody wants to say hi to you guys there. And in the second hour, I think we're going to talk some about medical colonialism, self-sabotage, circumcision, and uh, baby mutilation, basically. Oh, man, bad stuff. And well, damn, we're going human, there. human design, too, and uh, addiction. Those are the things that I have on, on my mind for the second half. We'll see how many of them we can actually touch on, but that's available at patreon.com slash interverse, like usual. And the Discord server I mentioned, you can find a link to from my website. If that link doesn't work, please let me know. <laughs> and we'll catch you guys in the second hour. Thank you for this amazing first hour of this chat. This is everything I hoped for and, and wanted and more. You guys are really beautiful and kind of calmed me down a little bit. I was all jazzed up and now I'm feeling more relaxed. So thanks for that too. <laughs> cool. cool man. <laughs> thanks so much for having us. Booyah kasha. Oh yeah, that was a good episode. I tend to get pretty excited regardless of who I'm talking to, but whenever we have these conversations about health and psychology and this like blending of the two sides, balancing the left and the right body and mind, I love it, man. Eurasimos and Sophie are now hopefully going to be like lifetime buddies of mine. I plan to work with Eurasimos for some body work stuff like training because we are very far apart from each other, but I, I want to get some ideas about things I can do for, you know, my own personal body issues and making progress on that direction because the, the old exercise till I'm sore thing isn't necessarily getting to the root of physical issues or past traumas. And man, can't wait to dig deeper with him on a personal level and hopefully have both of them back and, you know, Sophie's still working on her PhD. Just imagine the kind of things she's going to be contributing to our understanding of this connection between body and mind once she's doing her own personal work beyond just the education process. I think that she's picked a really good thing to study and depth psychology when paired with this transformational body work stuff. I'm telling you, this is like the keys to freedom for humanity. This is where it's at. It starts in the body. We probably could have talked more about the way that society basically is filled with people who find it displeasurable to be in their body. And that has a lot to do with the way that they view the world, the way they reject nature, the way they reject each other, and ultimately the way they self-murder their deepest, truest self and put on the mask of the persona. And in some cases, there's masks on masks on masks. Probably all of us have some degree of mask wearing when it comes to our personas, but it's not that we have to get rid of the persona as a function of our psyche. It's actually just about integrating the shadow and recognizing our power to choose what that persona is and how it expresses. And that's actually kind of like a cool thing. It's an empowerment thing that we actually get to be the person we want to be. We don't have to be the character we think we've been assigned and that's a big deal, man. So a lot of us think that the mask that we wear, we don't even think about the mask we wear. We think that's just who we really are. And the fact is we get all the choice in the world about all these things. So I loved this first con first hour of the conversation. I'm pretty sure the touch factor was in the first hour talking about touch as a big, big, important part of our lives. But just in case you didn't hear us talk about touch, maybe that was in the second hour. I got to admit, I'm in a little bit of a time crunch this week, and I really want to get a podcast out to you guys so that there's at least four for June. Some of you pay for it. <laughs> and it's not always easy to pull that off, but I'm working on it. And hopefully, if it's not right out right away at the end of June, you'll see this at the beginning of July. Either way, uh, time crunch. So I didn't go back and listen through everything to see exactly where what was, but I do remember the majority of what we talked about in the second hour. And I want to tell you about that because if you didn't hear it, that means you're not a plus member. And that means you're just listening to the free hour, which means that you're missing out on a whole second hour of juicy, beautiful information and analysis. And I hope that you'll consider signing up on patreon.com forward slash interverse because you're the only support I got doing this thing. And I... <laughs> It's a wild ride, man, doing this with a, a regular job. I'm sure you can imagine trying to add on something as big as uh, a weekly two-hour podcast and 
I mean, you probably don't even realize all that goes into it, but a lot goes into it. Imagine adding that to your full-time job. And that's kind of where I'm at. Also trying to take care of myself and my body and not put the uh, working on myself thing aside just because I want to work on this. But it would really help me to work on myself and work on this more effectively if I got more support from you all. And $5 a month isn't too much to ask for, is it? I mean, seriously, $5 in a month? I do have to make a quick caveat about Patreon. I flipped a switch on the Patreon account. Maybe it wasn't a good idea, but it's irreversible. And basically the switch was that instead of being charged at the first of the month after you become a subscriber, it charges you right away. And then it charges you at the first of every month going forward. I know that sounds kind of stupid. You would think it should just charge you a month away from whenever it was that you first signed up. Say if you got it on the 15th, it should charge you again on the 15th of the following month. Well, that's not the way Patreon does it. I'm sorry about that. I wanted to flip that switch though overall because it's only going to matter for that first month that you get a little less time on your initial five dollars. Start right start at July 1st if you want to get the full month out of your initial five bucks. But again, sorry about that. I just think it's probably better overall if it does charge you right away in case someone decided to like hop in get some content and then hop out right away uh i'm sorry if that sounds like bullshit that uh <laughs> you you think i shouldn't have made that change but it is irreversible so again five dollars a month is barely asking for much and uh a little bit extra up front kind of seems okay in my book for how much work i put on this this thing so hope you're cool with it that's all i have to say about that again Patreon.com forward slash universe is where you get the second hour of the show and the whole archive of like a hundred extended shows. And in the second hour of this one, it was awesome. We talked about medical colonialism. I mean, that's a phrase I'd never heard put together, but I do believe that's where we find ourselves. I mean, that's kind of the with the Aldous Huxley quote I put at the beginning, the pharmacological revolution. It seems like that's the controller's plan for the final revolution, except maybe he wasn't quite recognizing the transhumanism revolution that goes hand in hand with the pharmacological one, but maybe he was, and that's just the way that he wanted to phrase it. Anyway, we are seeing the medical takeover of our entire society. If you didn't notice, the medical industry has wrecked the economy. <laughs> so however you feel about that, whatever, that aside, medical colonialism is a huge topic. We got into where Bill Gates and the uh, other vaccine crusaders of the world have literally been damaging, even in some cases, killing practically near genociding entire populations of people of color in Africa and other nations that are low income areas. It's a real problem. There's a real connection between the vaccine agenda and population reduction. Look into it. Corbett report. C-O-R-B-E-T-T -T, report on YouTube or CorbettReport.com. That's a great resource if you want to find out more about the topics of uh, medical colonialism, how the Rockefeller family took over medicine and the practice and teaching and education of medicine in the United States like 100 years ago. It's a crazy ride, but that dude Corbett has got amazing documentaries on all those topics, including a four-parter on Bill Gates. If you really want to go there, I did. I watched them all, but... You can find out the who, what, why, where, what for, all that of Bill Gates, where he came, came from, what his agendas seem to be, and how his methods have worked getting him there. I'll tell you just as a caveat, he's not the genius uh, inventor software guy that the PR makes him out to be. He's kind of more just like a litigious bastard that made his fortune by copywriting stuff that used to be open source. So I have a lot of problems with that, but I'm getting into a bit of a tangent. Let me tell you more about the second hour of the show to maybe entice you to sign up and get into it. We had a huge discussion on the idea of self-sabotage, and that is something, uh, I mean, I struggle with this big time. I'm, I know we all do to a degree, but like it seems to be in all my astrology charts and my human design or, or whatever that self-sabotage is a factor for me more than others due to the real emphasis and focus on solar plexus chakra issues that seems to be like baked into my particular human cookie. So learning some of uh, Erasmus's thoughts on getting ourselves out of self-sabotage and what it even is really it's gold. It's gold because it's about authenticity at the end of the day. And 
I've asked other people who are highly authentic or appear to be that very question. A lot of times I just get the question or the answer back when I'm like, how do you be real? They're just like, just be real. Just, just don't be fake. <laughs> and I get that. That makes total sense. But tell me that whenever I'm about to eat the sugar or whatever addictive thing that I might be about to do, you know, binge on video games or something. Tell me that whenever I've already made the decision. Where's the uh, just be real then? And so we talked about it and it's something we all have to come to grips with, with for ourselves, but really awesome part of the conversation. Worth it to get the second hour just for that. But it branched into this whole conversation on the alchemy of addiction and a very Jungian interpretation of addiction and alcoholism and alcohol itself as a main component of that conversation. And essentially how... I never quite made this realization, but it seems to be after this conversation, I think I'm pretty convinced that addiction is like the literal polar inverse opposite of spiritual development or spirituality. So there's a lot to that. It's also really interesting to take the alchemical look at alcohol itself because it's actually an alchemical tool. It's not really meant to be like this recreational thing, but it definitely makes sense after what we talked about in this second hour here to say that alcohol is like the perfect drug for a materialist, a a culture lost in materialism, both spiritual materialism, scientific materialism, philosophical materialism and consumerism type of materialism, all of that. So great conversation there. Really worth listening to might make you rethink alcohol, not bashing you if it's something you do drink sometimes or even get drunk. We all have our crutch. We all have our thing. You might not even see it as a crutch. That's good. That's good for you, man. It's cool. Humans have had it for a long time. Maybe it's not the devil, but it is interesting to analyze the concept of alcohol from the alchemical perspective. I think you'll like it. I think it'll give you a lot to think about. And we also had a little bit of time to talk about human design. In the second hour, something I'm not super well versed in, but the various wisdom traditions and divination methods that make up human design, I am pretty into, familiar with, knowledgeable on. So that's a really cool conversation as well. Your SMOS is a human design type guy. He's a coach of that, or I don't know if you call him a coach of that, but he gives people human design readings as a part of how he's coaching them. Pretty cool. And Again, my looking into it is kind of just cursory surface level. I don't know if I'm fully on board with it as a concept, but I'm not like against it either. You know, it's like a lot of things. Maybe it's 80% good and you just have to take what resonates and leave the rest. Sometimes that's just what it is. It is a human made system, human design. (laughs) So it's probably not a perfect one to one description of nature and your personality, but it could be pretty useful. It might be something that really helps you out a lot to see like this resonant reflection of who you are on the inside put into words in front of you and help you see that in a more objective way could be cool so he he can be hit up for human design readings or you can just get into that yourself at jovianarchive.com jovian like the old way of describing jupiter jove j-o-v-i-a-n archive.com so check out your chart it's very weird looking and you're going to need to dig a lot deeper than just looking at the chart to understand it similar to if you're looking at your astrological star chart where it's that wheel kind of a similar deal but incorporating more than just astrology i wanted to talk to the both of them about circumcision because i've heard your SMOs talk about that on other shows before and it was on unslaved actually so if you want more of these two go to unslavedpodcast.com become a member of that after you became a member of Interverse, of course, because you've got enough money to sign up to two podcasts and go for it. And I hope you do. But check them out on Unslaved. If you're already a member there and you didn't catch those episodes, definitely go listen to them because I think they'll give a lot of good context in addition to what we talked about here, especially on the psychology level. Because, I mean, hopefully it didn't feel this way, but it's the, the problem of having two guests at once is that I kind of felt like I was focused more on your SMOs at different points throughout the episode. Sophie kind of took a backseat here and there. I mean, there were times where she got to speak and she said such awesome stuff. I just kind of think maybe next time I got to have them one-on-one, one at a time, each of them, even though they're such a good duo and they support each other's thoughts so well. But if you did feel like I gave Sophie a slight sh- um, short end of the stick as far as how much time she got to talk, just know it's hard 
as the host to balance that out. I did try and uh, I'm sure she didn't seem bummed about it. She was cool. But uh, if you think that she's the the one that you're more interested in, just hit her up and talk to her. She's on Instagram. I put uh, their Instagram handles in the show notes. So I'm doing my best. <laughs> oh, you know what? <laughs> Probably shouldn't get into this, but there was one thing that I remember taking note of in the first hour when we were talking about I think we're talking about just societal chaos right now. Maybe got into Black Lives Matter a little bit, but or maybe got into slavery a little bit. But the uh, so for whatever reason, I have a note that I want to tell you about this. Let me just I'll just go for it. Did you know that the abolishment of slavery didn't actually happen fully? Did you know by the very, I think, 13th Amendment that supposedly abolished it? They have a nice little caveat in there that says you can still have slaves if they're prisoners. Well, that's the case. So let's be careful that we don't go any further into a prison type economy, prison type culture. I mean, we're already getting imprisoned in our homes during lockdowns and stuff like that. So it's not a far stretch of the imagination to see us all getting labeled as prisoners and treated as slaves. slaves. In fact, slaves used to have to wear those type of mouth covering masks back in the day. So anyway... The other thing I'll say about this whole 13th Amendment didn't actually end slavery. If you're a prisoner, you can still be a slave is. Wow, I haven't really heard anyone talking about this with Black Lives Matter, and I feel like it should be the first thing on everyone's mind instead of fucking statues and flags. But did you know that in Louisiana, which has got an basically entirely white legislature or you know body of politicians that come to the capitol buildings and do all the lawmaking and schmoozing and whatever those guys do with their nice little suits and polo shirts or whatever they have servants did you know they have servants did you know that all these white dudes in louisiana all their servants are black people pretty much did you know that And it's because these are guys that are prisoners in the biggest prison state in the entire country. Louisiana has got more prisoners per capita by a huge margin than any of the other states. It's like that state alone is bigger than a bunch of countries amount of prisoners. And the percentage of people that are in prison is madness. So turns out that a lot of these politicians are ex law enforcement. Who knew who happened to uh, be very invested in helping their buddies make more money in their prison industrial system by getting a lot of people in jail. So they do that. And the hell of it is that a really disproportionate number of those people are African-Americans. And regardless of why that might be, because their communities are lower income or because they're more specifically targeted, whatever. The end result is that these are the people that are working the privileged servant jobs at the Capitol buildings, like vacuuming their floors and serving them martinis or whatever the fuck. So it looks like an actual plantation. When you go look up pictures of like the servants in the uh, Louisiana Capitol building, it looks like you're back in the plantation days. And it's just crazy that people are so up in arms about statues, but they're not worried about the fact that prisoners are used as slaves in this country. And I mean, literally, I guess they give them a small amount of pay and, you know, you get the choice or you, you get to apply to work in the Capitol building. And that's like a privilege in that state, as opposed to being on a chain gang or, you know, breaking rocks with a, a ball and chain or whatever the hell the other option would be making license plates. I don't know, but a lot of states use their prisoners for that type of labor license plate creation. So prisoners are the slaves in this culture. Do you want to be a prisoner? I don't want to be a prisoner. Let's not move any closer towards that reality. And let's maybe raise a little more ruckus about this Louisiana thing, especially if you're in Louisiana, because it's a lot more important who's actually currently enslaved than it is, you know, what statues are out in the world. Good God. And a lot of those people are enslaved slash imprisoned because of retarded drug laws. I mean, that's probably the majority of it, if I had to guess. I, Don't get me wrong. I'm sure there's some violent criminals, but those guys are probably not the ones that are getting to be the servants in the Capitol building in this big symbolic charade of a neo plantation. So that pisses me off. I'm not really one to try to like make the race war heat up or whatever. But if there is an instance of racism, there's a real one, a super real one. And that's the most real one I've ever seen in, in 2020. But Don't get me wrong. I'm not like a white privilege guy either. I'm not going to tell you that you should feel guilty because of whatever some ancestors did. 
because you shouldn't. You should just be a good person now. You shouldn't have to follow the trend of like, you know, talking about all the same talking points that the everyone else is talking about. Otherwise, you're part of the problem. It's stupid. I mean, how many of these people were actually like anti-racism before all this became trendy? Probably not very many of them. It's okay. It's a noble goal. I'm not saying don't get into it. I'm not saying don't protest. I'm not saying don't be a part of trying to make a change. But if you really look into where BLM comes from, super sketchy. And I think all these big mass media backed movements and trendy things that go viral. There's a phrase for you. Nothing goes viral organically anymore. I promise it's all controlled. It, the, these things that go viral are not necessarily something that came from a nice place or from a good intention. And uh, I believe that the real reason why we're seeing all this come up now has a lot more to do with the cycles in our own psychology and the 52 year cycle of the Mayan calendar and how 52 years ago, 52 cards in the deck, 52 weeks in a year, 52 years ago, we we're in the same exact galactic energy, so to speak, space weather, whatever you want to call it, as 1968 is the same as 2020 on a astrological level. We're coming to another beginning of a type of cycle. It's not exactly the same as 1968, but in a lot of ways, there's a big parallel between these energies and on uh, four, four, which Gematria, that's a big number, 44, a nasty one in the way the secret societies use it. But in four, four, 1968, that's when they killed Martin Luther King Jr. And <laughs> that's a rabbit hole in itself. But the wild thing is here we are in 2020 with BLM and BLM and MLK in Gematria, which is replacing the letters with numbers in words to decode other meanings, decipher them. Well, the K is uh, the 11th number or the 11th letter, right? So you reduce that down and you get a two MLK and then BLM B is the second number or the second letter. So did that twice. So MLK backwards is the same as BLM. I hope you're following me here because the K and the B in Gematria reduced to the same number. So we're literally seeing like a mere reflection of MLK with BLM on purpose to stir the pot, to get people distracted, to push the, uh, the martial law thing further, faster, and the extreme surveillance state stuff further. Holy shit. You know what? I'm way off topic. We're not even talking about health anymore. <laughs> so I better get out of here. I did mention that I'm kind of in a hurry to get this produced. And here I go running my mouth for 20 minutes, but it's what I'm here to do. Talk about the stuff I see, sublimate my own emotional energy through speech because that's how I do it. I'm a big talker. Hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. Really appreciate you making it all the way to the end here. I mean, we're almost at the very end. Wow. That's great of you. You listened all the way to this point. You must really care. And I thank you. I care about you too. Love you. I hope you're doing well out there in this weird world and realizing that the, it's super beautiful and you're super empowered. And it's fun, actually, even to have to challenge these entrenched powers that be. It's a video game, man. It's a it's really high XP to play on hard. So take a hard path. <laughs> go go to the resistance. That's also assistance for you. Where the resistance is at in your body and and what you think you want to do, but feel like you can't, those are the places where the most growth is at. So get there, get in there, do it. I'm trying to do it, <laughs> doing my best. Make sure you check out the show notes for links back to your SMOS and Sophie, their Instagram, your, your SMOS's website. He's got an email on there. And I'm going to play us out with an awesome new song by Cadella called Steps, which I think is a great song. Great, great, great uh, feel for how I feel right now kind of getting back into some good vibes in my own self, healthier vibes. And this music makes me feel that type of way, way I felt last time I felt like I was kind of in some healthy vibes. So I <laughs> uh, hope you check out Cadella, K-A-D-E-L-A. -E you know, Cadella, I've played it before. So Cadella is awesome. You'll find that in the show notes too. And uh, got a lot of fun stuff to talk about in the future. I wish I could keep talking. I got so much I'd love to bring up and things I'm experimenting with in a cool way, but we'll get there. We got next week. And until then, I will see you guys on the flip side. Thanks for listening. Much, much love and enjoy the Cadella. 